critique me after we talk today because primarily I started out with a three hour uh, MCE class and now we're cutting it down to an hour. So I'll try to check with my notes. I want to give you the meat of what I want to, to share with you today and uh, not skip anything. So Nancy will prod me if I leave something out over here. So we're also working from a PowerPoint presentation that we're kind of modifying. So you're kind of guinea pigs today and that we're, we're cutting this down a little bit. But I want to tell you to begin with, uh, because I hear so many people saying I can't do that or you know that's that's impossible I'm not going to be able to make that happen so I want to tell you a little bit about my story about how I started with this uh, at age 49 I started my life over again my husband had had brain surgery and was told that he would never be capable of doing anything but pushing a broom so after three years he, he lost his vision and his ability to speak and we reworked with him con you know, constantly improving that. And after three years, he got enough tunnel vision back and was able to quit turning the words around enough so that he was probably, we, we felt at that point, 90 to 95% recovered. And he said, you know, I'd like to go back to law school. And I went, oh my goodness, you know, the man could barely talk. And he had started law school as a young man going under the GI Bill, ran out of money the last, uh, last semester and thought I'd go back later. So here we were at age 49, him recovering. I had a seven-year-old daughter, a mother with Alzheimer, no college degree. His illnesses had just run us into the ground financially. We were flat broke. I had enough money to last for four months, and we found this little law school in Dallas, Texas that would take him. So we loaded everything up, put it in a U-Haul trailer, and we took off for Dallas. And I got up there and I thought, oh my God, you know, I've got enough money just to get us in this little zero lot line I rented, and, and I've got to find a way to support my family. So I sat on the floor in this little zero lot line with the Dallas Morning News and the Fort Worth Star Telegram. I thought, okay, I've got to sell something I don't have to buy at first. It's got to be uh, Rolls Royces or airplanes or diamonds or hay. I think maybe I could sell houses. Well, then all the negative Nellies came out and said, oh, you can't do that. You can't sell houses in Dallas, Texas. You've never lived there. You don't know anybody there. And the big deal was, you've never sold real estate before. I said, okay, guys, watch me. I've got, I've got to do this. I've got all these people dependent on me. So the first full year I was with Debbie Halliday, I came in number two out of 980 agents on number of houses sold. Not in the prices, not in dollars, but in number sold. Because I worked seven days a week, and I worked every day of the year except Christmas, Thanksgiving, and I took New Year's off that one year. So I'm telling you this because I want you to know you have to put the effort in. It's not easy, but if I can do it, you can do it. So that was in 1991. So, you know, I was 49 years old. You can add the years. You can figure out how old I am. So I'm no spring chicken, and I still work seven days a week. So the things I want to cover with you today is what, is, what part of my business uh, was from new home construction and new home sales. One of the things that I figured out very quickly in the Dallas market, and I'm sure you have this also evident in your market, is that the Highland Park and the Park Cities, which is our real high-end uh, neighborhoods and our, our priciest uh, sales and home sales, they already had real estate agents. They, they had it locked up. So I figured out quickly that the best way for me to get started and make money was to go out in the more suburban areas or go to new home construction and <clears throat> figure out what was going on. And then I had a great motivator. My first electricity bill came in on that little zero lot line. And for 1,900 square feet, it was $450. And I thought, oh my gosh, this isn't in my budget. What am I going to do? And secondly, how does this happen? So it motivated me to start paying attention to what was going on in the construction business. And I thought, I'm going to find out why this house doesn't have any energy efficiency. So I called one of the major builders purchasing departments and I said, what is the difference in purchase price on this, this York air conditioner that was in that house versus the man or a train or a good one? It was $600. That was the difference in the purchase price. And I checked with other homes in the area that had better HVAC systems. We weren't even talking about total energy efficiency packages at that time. We were just talking about that one element. And the difference was $600. That's not significant when you're paying that much in the summer. 
So that motivated me that real estate agents don't really know their product. If you sell cars, you know what's under the hood. We need to know what's under the floors and behind the walls. And if you're really good at this, and I'm going to point out some things that I think make a difference to you today and what I started gathering information that I tell my clients, and I mean it sincerely, they better be afraid to go without me because they don't know what they're getting. I mean, I caught one major builder, you know, it's, it's, and, and I, I didn't know a two before from a two by six when I started. But it didn't take me long. I bought a level and a measuring tape, and I started crawling over construction sites. Caught one major builder putting his studs on 24-inch centers. If you don't know what that means, it means they're supposed to be a minimum of 18. Most good builders put them on 16-inch centers. And what happens when you spread that stud out to, to a 24-inch center, your drywall is going to look great when the house is new. So those builders know that. And when that house is 12 to 18 months old, that drywall is going to crack and it's going to sag. And it's going to cost that, that uh, consumer a lot more money. That builder knows that. So there are a lot of things I found out in my research and my examination and crawling over these construction sites that it's an attempt to deceive us. They're cutting money in ways that they shouldn't be cutting money. And I've been asked to leave a lot of construction sites. I've had, I've had one guy double up his fist and he threatened to hit me because I told him he didn't do it right. So, you know, I mean, I, I had one gentleman that I went in, I'd walked the house, and it was in a real hot neighborhood. We had people standing in line, especially to get a treed lot, and we had a treed lot. And Man, I'd been through the building process and with my clients, and <coughs> pardon me, the Houston allergy's getting me today. And so, um, this one curved wall was, had a lump in it. So I told Jimmy, the builder, and he said, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll fix that. Went back two days later. We were ready to close in a couple of weeks. Still the same way. I told him, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll get to that. Third time I went in, he said, okay, I'll fix that. I'll fix that wall for you. And he goes in and he puts a patch on it. It looked worse than it did before. So I go back the fourth time. I said, Jimmy, we're not going to close on this house until that wall's fixed. He said, I fixed that wall four times, and I'm not fixing it again. So I don't care if you fixed it 17 times. It's not fixed. We're not closing until you fix the wall. He said, I tell you what, lady, I'm going to march your little butt over to the sales office. I'm going to give you your money back, and we'll sell that house to somebody else. But this time I had my husband out of law school, and I said, you know what, Jimmy? There's something you don't know about me. I worked real hard to get this man through law school, and I know just enough law to tell you that nobody but my client's going to live in that house for the next five years, so you better fix it. He said, you're a real bitch. He started calling me names. And all the little workers in the kitchen that were working on stuff got real quiet. They were listening. So obviously, he was kind of mean to them, too. And by that time, I'd lost my temper, but I didn't yell. But I just said, I tell you what, Jimmy, I don't think you know how to fix that wall. I think that's why it's not fixed, because you don't know how to fix it. So I'm going to bring my crew in. I'm going to tear out that drywall. I'm going to move that stud out about an inch, and then that wall will lay like it's supposed to, and I'll fix it. So you just stand down and stand back, and I'll fix it. That's when he doubled up his fist and threatened to hit me. And I backed up, and I thought, you know, Marion, maybe you went too far this time. So I'm not telling you to do that, OK? But that same builder, he got moved out of there, obviously, and uh, was sent, I think, to Georgia or someplace. But Anyway, I was in the this same building, and I'm telling you these prefaces before we go over things because I want you to know your clients need you. They do need you. And so I was in a house, and there was something wrong with the shoe molding. I don't remember exactly why I was on the floor, but I was down on the floor in the corner crawling around looking at something. And these two builders came in from that. This was the same subdivision. I had Jimmy problems. And I was over on the floor, and they walked in, and one of them said to the other one, hey. I found a way we can save $35 a house for, for our, our company. And uh, the other guy said, really, what? He said, well, we're going to put three can lights in the kitchen instead of four. And I pop, and these are $400,000 houses. I pop up off the floor and I go, oh, you're going to have my clients cooking in the dark, huh? Well, they almost had a heart attack, you know, because they'd already been heard about me with Jimmy. So they were quaking in their boots. But the whole thing is, guys, you've got to stay on top of it. And I don't care what the reputation the builder has, but there is always a need for us as an extra set of eyes. Now, something I will caution you about 
is that when you are very proactive with your client, with a builder, once you sign that contract and you're there, most real estate agents don't go back until the last walkthrough. That's a big mistake. Your clients, the builder, they don't feel like you've earned your keep and you haven't, in my opinion. But what happens, I see this all the time because I walk homes all the time and I see realtors trying to make a big show of the fact, hey, we're here now, you know, we're going to make a big stand and we're going to show you all the things you did wrong. That's really the worst thing you can do. Number one, you're making your client dissatisfied with their home. You've made the builder look bad. The builder's mad at you. The client's mad at everybody. So what you do is you go in and say, hey, you know, these builders pay their contractors a flat fee for putting what they've done in this house. And when they pay them that, we're an extra set of eyes here at the last moment to help them find the defects so that they can call those same guys in that they've already paid for the work to finish finish out this house and do it correctly. When we don't have that extra set of eyes and we miss something, the builder has to pay extra work for warranty. So we're helping the builder be the extra set of eyes. You make sure the builder or your guy on site there hears you say this, tell them this guy's a good builder and we're just going to help with this situation. You make your client happy, you make the builder happy, and you've really helped, you know, made the process a lot, a lot neater through the end. So, like I said, I have a whole bunch of things I want to talk to you about. I'm going to skip around a little bit because I've got three hours worth of data I'm going to try to give to you in, in 55 minutes. Okay, I ask clients all the time or ask other realtors when we're doing seminars, what is your product? And most real estate agents will go, well, I sell homes. Your product is a well-built quality home at an affordable market price. That's what you're supposed to do for your clients. And <clears throat> when you, okay, Nancy, there we go. When, when I tell other agents and I also tell clients this, and this started with um, one of the most annoying clients I ever had in my life. I had him in the car and he whined all the time. And I still had my husband in law school and this man was driving me absolutely crazy. And every house we'd go into, we'd get in the car, and he'd pull out his little calculator, and he'd calculate price per square foot. And he said, and I can't find a good woman to marry me, you know, and he whined. And I, I thought, if you'd quit whining, you know, and if you, you know, and you're not going to find a good house if you're only going to look at price per square foot. So finally, after three days, I'd just about had, I would drive along and think, gosh, if I could just figure a way to get this man in my car, and I'd really think about, we'd drive by signs, and they'd have the graphic in the sign, and I'd think, I'm going to get him to get out and get that, and then I'm going to speed off and leave his little <laughs> self on the sidewalk. So the third day, I'd listened to him whine, and I had him doing the calculator, and I finally said, Lewis, I've been showing you the wrong things. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, if I'd have known that price per square foot was the most important thing to you, I would have been showing you mobile homes with vinyl floors, because that's the best price per square foot. But if you want more, then we're going to have to pay a little more. So remember that with your clients. You know, you have to give them an expectation that upgrades and amenities cost more. And so everything's not about the price per square foot because we can get you a mobile home with vinyl floors and it's going to give you the best price per square foot in the marketplace. But I don't think it's what most of our clients want. So you set their expectations right, right there in the beginning. Okay. And, and like I said, the more you know, the more you're going to make your clients afraid to go without you. Now, <clears throat> we're going to go over some things, of the basics on, on um, uh, you know, what happens in pouring the slab and your, your plumbing and everything. But I want to tell you a few little tips that I give, too, that uh, the two most important words in, in residential construction are plumb and level. If you don't see that that house is plumb and level, then your windows aren't going to fit properly, your doors aren't going to fit properly, you're going to have wind and water that are going to come in uninvited, and that's a big issue too. And then I tell also our clients, you know, they say, oh, I want a brick house that's strong. Go, no, this is not the three little pig story. We don't build brick houses. We build wooden houses, wood frame houses with a brick facade. They go, oh, you know, I said, no, it's not stronger built out of bricks. It's still the wood house. So, and you need to, you need to, to get their expectations of what, what the market is. 
our market has track homes, volume homes, and customs home, custom homes, basically. And I tell my clients, and some of you may disagree with me, especially if you represent custom builders, but I tell my clients, I don't recommend that you do a custom home until you're over a million dollars in price. Why is that? The industry standard expectation is that a custom home builder that builds under 150 homes, that his cost is 7% more than a volume builder. So, you know, your client is in the price range of over two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars, they're still their best bit bet for for quality at the best affordable market price is a volume builder. Because if seven percent is the cost that a custom builder is going to have to pay for the additional cost he's going to incur in lumber and, and appliances and everything he puts in that house because he's not buying in volume. That custom builder is buying enough for two or three houses at a time or maybe even five and ten. But he can't compete with Darling and Highland and Huntington who are buying their appliances a thousand cooktops at a time and they're buying their lumber and box car loads full. So if you figure that seven percent of that cost to the home, you can't feel it, touch it, see it, you're not getting it because that's the additional cost. You need to really get your clients on board that this is why I recommend a volume builder for you and then you can customize it because otherwise that's $35,000 in a $500,000 house that you're not going to see. We also have a major builder that spends an advertising budget for national advertising of approximately 7%. Same story. So you're not getting the benefit to the client. And our job, in my opinion, and I think it should be yours, is that we get the best product for the money that we can for our clients. Now, I'm trying not to skip around so much because y'all have to bear with me here. Um, you know, and this is something else I'll tell our, our, our clients. Remember that our homes are built piece by piece by a bunch of different hands. That all of our, our homes are probably the last major thing that we construct that's all built by hand. So you're going to have some imperfections. So you want to make sure that you check that the builder that you recommend has deep pockets and is going to be there to service them after the sale. So, you know, do your research. And what I did, I did a talk radio show for a year because I was so frustrated with so much bad building and bad construction. We have such a huge relocation market in Dallas, and these bad guys just kept building houses. So I call it the good guys versus the bad guys. And people would call in on the radio show and say, well, what do you think about this one? And my husband told me I have to quit saying in public as he's an attorney now, I can't say that Grand Homes is the worst builder I've ever seen in my life. He said, you've got to quit saying that. I said, well, you know, it's in my opinion. And the other thing is, if they take me to court and say they're not, I think I can prove they are. You know, I've got photos, so I'll, I'll show they are. So, you know, you, you've got to be knowledgeable about what's going on in the marketplace and your product. Okay. Uh, something that'll kind of, I think, help you. Let's see. Energy efficiency, we'll go over that in just a second. I want to tell you a couple of things that also help you with pre-owned homes that I point out to the clients. When you drive into a neighborhood and when someone says, how can I tell quality once the walls are up and the floors are there and you can't see whether the, the framing is aligned and you don't know what's going on in that house. Well, the first thing that denotes quality in the neighborhood is the roof pitch. If you drive into a neighborhood and it has nice high roof pitches in that neighborhood, you know, that's extra money that builders spend. That's, that shows, and I have people, I'll drive through neighborhoods and I test them. You know, you put people in your car and they'll go through a neighborhood and they'll go, that last neighborhood we looked at looks so much better. Well, it's because the roof pitch was higher. It looks more expensive. It is more expensive and it looks it. So that's something you get, you get good resale value for that. And this is something also we need to always keep in mind for our clients. I have clients in the 22 years I've been doing this that I've done seven and eight transactions with. And it's because, the deal I've told you, I tell them you better be afraid to go without me, but also because they know I'll look after them. If I feel like they're going to buy a house that's not going to resell the best, then I tell them, don't buy that house. And I've had clients that, that came to me and said, I've heard you're great, I want to buy this grand home, and I go, no, I'm not going to sell it to you. You know, you'll have to go get another realtor if you want that home. I, I refuse to do it. You have to make yourself have credibility if you're going to stand behind this and say, I'm going to tell you what you need to know 
and what to do, then you need to stand behind that. Okay, the other thing is when you walk, drive into a neighborhood and you look at the roof pitch, the next thing when you pull in front of a house, I tell my clients, the first thing I want you to look for is what's on the front porch. If that builder didn't cover that raw concrete with pavers or leftover brick or something, I know that's my first clue that he cut corners in the rest of the house that you can't see. The house is already built, so I can't go check and see how far he spaced his studs apart, what else he's, he's maybe done behind the walls and under the floors. But that's my biggest clue in that house. If he didn't spend the extra money, which he's already got the workers there, he's probably got leftover brick to cover that because nothing makes a house look older and more decrepit than pulling up to the front door, walking up there, and here's this old, raw, unfinished concrete which cracks and yellows there. So that's the second, the, the second clue. The next thing you look for is an eight-foot door or a six-foot eight door at the front because when the builder does the eight-foot door package, He's got a little bit higher ceilings. You have to have a minimum of 10-foot ceilings throughout the house. So with the 8-foot doors, that also denotes quality. The next thing that you look at when you walk in the house, I tell my clients, okay, we've passed the first couple of things I'm going to point out to you now. For subsequent houses, I'm going to give you a test. I want you to check and see how many return air vents are in this house. And I take them into the room and I show them here are the supply vents and here's the return air vent. Now, I personally prefer when they put the return air vent down low, and it has to be in front of a chase, but now in today's market, they're putting the houses up so fast, they do usually put the return air vents in the ceiling. I'll let them get by with that. It's not my favorite way to do it, but at least it's in there. Okay, if you go into a house that does not have adequate return air vents, what do you see? Have you ever gone into a home when I first moved to Dallas, and I thought, gosh, these people have the worst vacuum cleaners in the world. What's wrong with these houses? All the doors across the bedroom had little black lines. Going up the stairs had little black lines. That is dirt particles collecting when you close the door because you don't have a return air vent in that bedroom. So if you don't have adequate return air vents, it not only doesn't take the moisture out of the air properly, it also leaves that little dirt particle under there. So I've had a big discussion with us about one of our major builders who says they like jump vents and a jump vent is just a grate in the wall between two rooms and he says that works works just as well so they flew their head of quality construction in from Phoenix to convince me he was right and I said okay if you're right then why in this door to the study that has a jump vent do we have that black line he said I'll get back with you on that never did of course because he didn't have an explanation Every bedroom in that house better have a return air vent or I'm not going to sell it. And probably every room in the house should. There may be some rooms where you don't have an adequate space for a chase, but there should be return air vents in most of the rooms in the house. And I will tell you, we have some major builders, and I've gone in. I sold a 6,200 square foot home to a, one of the builders you mentioned a while ago. And I was going over the blueprints and everything, and he had two return air vents for 6,200 square feet. And I said, uh, that, that's not going to work. <sighs> you want return air vents in every room? And I said, yes, I do. Uh, how much is that? Well, that's going to be $1,800. Okay, then I noticed that there's no cabinet around the refrigerator in the kitchen, which you have in the model. And we said we want this home just like the model. You want that cabinet in the kitchen too? Well, how much is that? Well, that's $1,800. Okay, and we want that island. I've noticed on the blueprints also that island's not as big as the one in the kitchen. And we said we want it just like the kitchen. You want that bigger island too? Well, of course, that was $1,800 too. So everything that my client thought they were getting was $1,800. So in, I have a book I've published, and I also you can go online, and I do have a list called I Want, I Need, a Wish List. And I recommend that you take that or some version of it, but I spent a lot of time putting that together. And that's what you need to take with your clients. I have clients that'll say, oh, you know, I don't need a realtor for new home construction. You know, I've got this great on-site person. I go, really? Who does that on-site person represent? I'll tell you who they represent. They represent the builder. They don't represent you. And I'll say, okay, so the builders told you you're gonna get a wood fence. Is that right? Oh yeah, what are you getting? And they said, well, I'm getting a wood fence. I go, really, is it six foot? Is it eight foot? Is it board on board? Is it pine? Is it cedar? Is it stained? Is it unstained? Does it have trim? Does it have metal posts? Does it have wood posts? What are you getting? They go, I don't know. 
I say hardwoods. They told you you're going to get hardwoods. Okay, are they glued down? Are they nailed down? Are they two and a quarter? Are they three and a half? Are they five inch? Are they scraped? Are they unscraped? What kind of wood are they? I don't know. Your clients don't know what they're getting. So you need to be there to make sure because, you know, you're their liaison. And a lot of people don't realize they need you more than ever in new home construction. So get your story down straight, get it right so that you tell them up front why they need you. This I want, I need, I wish list can point out a lot of things that they've never thought of that they're not going to get. When I do construction seminars out in the field, I always have an HVAC guy there. And one of the things the HVAC guy will say is, you know, somebody invariably in the audience will say, well, I know this builder's putting 14 sear air conditioning in. And, uh, I'm not going to ask you <laughs> Say, when you talk about SEER writing, please know what it means. SEER means Seasonal Energy Efficiency Ratio. That's just kind of showing off. Maybe it doesn't mean anything, but you should know what it means when you're discussing it. Okay, when you say, okay, this guy's putting 14 SEER, and for years I sold houses with 10 SEER. But now we're going more to 16 SEER. Invariably, some realtor in the room will say, to the HVAC guy, okay, well, should we get them to get 19 here? Isn't that better? And of course, the HVAC guy who's going to sell air conditioning units and heating units is going to say, oh, sure, yeah, 19 here is better. And I have to jump in there and say, no, no, no. Yes, it's better, but it's not economically feasible. The payout in a 3,500 square foot home on a 19 here versus a 16 here is a 10-year payout. 10 year. Most of my clients don't live in a house for 10 years. I had a crazy client that put, I didn't know them until I got ready to list their house. They put a 21 sear air conditioning in a 1,700 square foot house that paid thousands and thousands of dollars. I sold their house a year and a half later and they said, how much am I going to get extra for that? And I went, five bucks, you know, maybe 10, probably nothing. You're not going to get it back. They said, well, the air conditioning guy told us it's better. I said, it is better, but it's stupid, you know? Why did you not have a realtor before you did that, you know? So, and if you make this relationship with your clients when you sell them this and they find out you know what you're talking about, guess what? They may drive you crazy. They'll call you when they change light fixtures. They'll call you because they want to change the paint color. They'll call you when they want a new microwave. But guess what? You've got a client for life. And so, this is all about what can we do. So. Okay, we're going to talk about the construction basics, grading and leveling the lot. We there? Okay. The lot preparation. Okay, when you go out and you sell a client a new home, and I heard someone talking a while ago about, you know, with the, the market hot like it is right now, and I know it's hot in Houston like it is in Dallas, and we have helicopters flying over what we call the A lots. I don't know if y'all have taken the time to figure out where your A lots, your A minus, your B plus, and your B lots are, but believe me, the builders know where they are and your developers know where they are. So you know when you start looking at those hot areas, the ones that are the most in demand and are going to have the best resale for your clients, those builders are looking for those A lots and those A minus lots and especially those B plus lots. They're in your hot areas and they're going to pay more for it. And we calculate, and it's still pretty close to this, it's skewed a little bit now with the hot market, but 20 to 21% of your lot cost should be, the, it figure out to the total price of your house. So if you pay $100,000 for the lot, the price of the house should be 500000 You get too far off of that and it doesn't work for resale. It skews the whole economics of our comps and what we work with. So always kind of figure that out. Now, I'll tell you, the builders aren't going to tell you what they paid for the lot. You can kind of figure that out if you get real familiar with the area. But you need to know what you're looking at for resale. The other thing is I tell my clients, you, do ne you never, never, never buy a lot with two negatives. A negative is a busy street behind you. I don't ever let anybody buy anything with those transformers. And he had a list that, listing that she got. And of course, we couldn't sell it. It was a great house because they had those stupid transformers. The people thought, we bought it. Why did it, you know, why is the rest of the public? Well, the public perception is that there's something wrong, even though the electrical companies will tell us there's no damage there. 
I prefer not to sell it because I know it's going to be difficult for resale. Always tell your client, I'm going to look after you for resale. I'm going to tell you what's going to sell more easily because I want to be your realtor that you call when you get ready to sell it. And you start selling your resale up front. And it also helps your credibility. It's one more thing to do that. Then you tell them on the lot preparation, do you know that the builders engineer maybe one lot per block? Some builders only engineer one, one lot for three or four blocks. That's not so bad if you have a flat terrain that was a cotton patch before and it all looks the same. But if you've had any fill dirt or you have any terrain issues there, it is a big issue. So when you go in and your client picks a lot, you need to find out where was the engineering done on this lot because then we have to talk about water injection versus chemical, chemical injection. If you go to my website, I have a, an interview that I did with the president of American Legend Homes on the difference between water injection and chemical injection on lots. You need to know what that means and you need to know how that influences the, the slab and the, the soil conditions of that lot. You may not have as, as uh, porous of a clay soil here that we have in Dallas, but it's a big <coughs> issue. And, you know, water injection, I have never, ever had a foundation failure in a home that's had water injection. My builders are now using chemical injection and as, as the mainstay for most, most subdivisions because when we do water injection, you're injecting the area just under the slab. Then the area right outside the slab only lasts for about three years. Chemical injection, once they put that down, and you, you know, under the slab, you have plastic that goes over it, and then you pour the slab on top. And it's, it, you know, this has been going on for 15 years, and we're still uh, seeing the effects that it, that's working. We're not having foundation problems with that. Chemical injections are forever. They know that even outside where you have the plastic and the slab put on top, you don't have the movement problem because it swells that soil to a permanent swelled level, and it's called PVI. And uh, <clears throat> it's going to it's going to stay that way. You need to know those things. You need to go into a subdivision and you need to find out where was the lot engineered, where is that, what's going to go on behind it. Obviously, you know to do that. But you also need to know was there a water injection or chemical injection done on that lot. Okay, those are things you need to tell them. All right, then when you do, I go out and I walk the lot with my clients when they do the form boards. And I can't tell you how many times I've gone out there and the form boards are crooked. And you tell the builder, you know, I, I don't like that form board's not real straight over here because I know when they get out here to pour the slab, they're going to pour it next to that form board. I, I'm not real comfortable with that. Ah, we'll fix it. Mm -mm. I want to see them fix it. You need to see them fix it. That form board needs to be straight. All right, then they go and they set the plumbing. So what happens when you've added a sink in the utility room or in the garage? That builder may or may not pick that up. And so when you go out there, if that plumbing's not set for that sink you added in the garage or in that utility room, you need to note that. You need to tell your client, hey, we're missing something here. Hey, Mr. Builder, you need to put that, you know, you need to make sure that that plumbing is set for the sink we added. Because guess what? When it's not added at that point, they'll come in and jackhammer that slab up. And they'll say, oh, no problem. Well, guys, I'm here to tell you it is a problem. And they all do it. Okay, then we're going to go ahead and, and um, pour the slab. And when they go out there, and well, I'm not going to give you a lesson on post-tension slabs today, but hopefully you know what, what happens. If you don't, please Google that and figure that out right away. But I will tell you something you may not know on pouring the slab, because I had to learn this the hard way, too. If you have a builder that doesn't have somebody on site that knows what in the heck he's doing and is, you know, paying attention, when they pour that slab, when that cement truck leaves the plant, it has three hours. You see that truck going out there and that back end of that truck swirling around and around and around. It's keeping that cement moving. Three hours is your max, and that starts to set up. When it leaves that plant, it has a metal tag that's put on the back of that truck, and it shows the time it left the plant. This is a big city too, I don't know about y'all, but we have areas that are two and a half hours away from the sites and they better, you know, they better hook them to that site. 
because those guys that are out there working that have on those big boots and they're pouring, they're straightening that slab out, guess what? If that builder's not there to check that metal tag to see that that's done in time, those guys aren't going to say anything because they lost a day's work. If they say, hey, that truck's late getting here so we can't pour the slab, they're not going to say that. They're going to water that slab down. And if you ever go past the construction site and they're hosing and watering that slab down, that's what they're doing, guys. And that's not good. So if I don't know that my builder is going to be out there, I'm out there. And I check that little tag on that truck to make sure it's not late. Because Darling Homes, I was working with them on a deal, and the guy didn't show up and didn't show up, and the builder was out there, and the truck didn't show up. He had to stop by and visit his parole officer on the way. <laughs> he didn't quite make it on time. So, you know, be involved. Know what's going on every step of the way. So the next, next slide. Here we go. Framing and roofing. Okay, we talked a little bit about, uh, oh, and on the plumbing, I'll tell you, we have a big discussion all the time about copper versus PEX on your, your plumbing. And I will tell you that American Legend Homes, which is one of my favorite builders, they think PEX is the way to go. Highland Huntington, they think copper is the way to go. I listen to the experts on both sides, and I've listened to them to debate it ad infinitum for the last three years. And I tell you, I don't have any idea which one's better. You know, I listen to both arguments. There's advantages to both. So you might want to look and see what your builder's doing and just ask him why he's using it. And you can tell your client, this builder is using copper, and this is why he's doing it. You know, so if he wants to examine PECs, but they're, they're all real committed one way or the other. There's no, somebody saying, well, maybe this. They're, all, you know, Highland swears that copper's the best. American Legend swears PECs is the best. It's more flexible, different reasons. Okay, so we've got the slab board. We've got that ready to go. Okay, then I hear um, when we do, we do two by fours instead of two by sixes in most parts of Texas. Up north, where it's colder, they use two by six construction, and the reason is because they can put more insulation in the walls. They have snow, they have a lot colder weather than we do, and the walls are real important. In 